Hi, everyone. Um, I'm going to be talking about chapter 16 today, um, about uh, sampling distributions and confidence intervals. So first things first, um, let's say, you know, you're in your stats class and your teacher or, you know, I want to take a sample I, I want to sample how many of you guys have studied in the last week. So I'd get some kind of sample proportion. You know, let's say there's 25 students and 20 of them have studied, right? I get a proportion of 80%. Then I go to a different section and maybe 18 out of 23 people have studied. Now I have two samples and two sample portions, like 80% and then like 70 something percent. If I keep doing that, over and over again, I get what's called a sampling distribution. And it looks something like this. You have your sample portion. And then here you have number of samples. Let's say the average, uh, there's a lot around 0.7. And then maybe it tapers off. But we find out it's really left skewed. Maybe a lot of people just don't study. Now, we can't really apply any of our, any of the math we've used because this is not a unimodal and symmetric histogram. Clearly, this is left skewed. Um, but as we increase um, sample size and the number of samples, this turns into a really nice unimodal and symmetric histogram. Um, this is something known as the central limit theorem. Um, it's, it's formally talked about in a later chapter. I just wanna get you guys the idea. And here, this is, this approaches our population proportion with the same y-axis, number of samples. So this is called the sampling distribution. And as it, once it becomes unimodal and symmetric, we can approximate this by a normal because, you know, we have a nice bell curve shape. Now, we have the binomial distribution, binomial NP. We know the expected value of binomials N times P, but we got to divide by the sample size. So that means it's the mean or expected value of a sampling distribution is P, population proportion. Similarly, uh, let's do the standard deviation. It is square root NPQ, but we need to divide by N. So this becomes square root PQ over N because square root of N divided by N is one over square root of N. So this turns into this distribution up here is a normal with mean P standard deviation square root of PQ over N. Where remember Q is one minus P it is the constant. Um, so something I want to make very clear. We write this the standard deviation of p hat. This is our sample proportion. Is the square root of p q over n. These are our population portions. So in reality, we can't ever do this because we don't know our population proportions. If we did, we wouldn't need samples. If you know population parameters, there's no need for statistics. Um, so while this is nice and all, if we know our population proportion, like how we know every time we flip a coin, it's a 50-50 chance to get heads or tails. But in real life, this is useless. So we develop the standard error, which is SE of p hat is square root of p hat q hat over n. 
Here we have our sample proportions. This is a number that we can achieve just by, you know, doing an experiment or a survey, depending on the context. Um, so this also tells us how much variation there is. This tells us the variation between samples. Since you know each sample will be different for one reason or another. So in order to approximate this, in order to approximate a sampling distribution as a normal p square root pq over n, we need the following conditions. First is the independence assumption. Excuse the handwriting. Um, so each individual in a sample must be independent. Um, we can really chalk this up to a good survey, a good sampling method, like a simple random sample or such. Um, these, this can be so essentially assumed. Similarly, we have the randomization condition. Um, again, this is, you know, basically, do we have a random sample? Next, we have the 10% condition. This is our sample size must be less than 10% of the population size. Um, the reason this is a thing, first of all, in practice, this is basically never going to be achieved unless you have a, like an extremely small population. Um, basically, because once you have like 10%-ish of the population, it people, there's a very low chance of people being independent just because people know each other or might be related or depending on whatever we're talking about. Next is the success failure condition. Um, this means that NP must be greater than or equal to 10 and NQ must be greater than or equal to 10. This is the first of many what I like to call normality conditions. Um, by n times p and n times q, both they both have to be greater than ten or equal to. That means we have a big enough sample that we know our distribution will look like that. N nice. We'll see very similar conditions basically every class now for the rest of the course. So from here. We're starting to build up the idea of a confidence interval. The standard error, which I mentioned above, is the first step. The next thing we're about to talk about is called a critical value. Now, this corresponds to uh, what's called our confidence level. Confidence level is a percentage we're gonna say something like we want a 95% confidence interval. So our confidence level would be 95%. Um, there are a few common confidence. Uh, so there are two, starting we're just gonna talk about Z scores. We'll call them Z critical, which are written like Z and a little asterisk. And this is gonna be some percentage. Uh, just to give you a few, just so you guys can like write down your flashcards or just, just to memorize. Um, so, 90% is 1.645. 90, oops. 95% is 1.96. However, we are allowed to use two. 
um, 98% is 2.326. And 99% is 2.576. So here are a few uh, key ones. Um, you could always ask to be to choose to some to do some random one, which I will show you how to find in just a second. Okay, so when we talk about say a ninety five percent confidence interval, that means that we have this area is point nine five. This whole area. Now, in order to back solve the z-score, because we, we know there's a z, a negative z here and a z here. There's two ways to find a z-score, or to use the z-score table. Either we have a z-score and we find an area, or we have an area, we find it, and then we back solve the z-score from there. So let me change this to, say, 92%. That means this area is 0.92. That means this area is 0.04. And this is 0.04 because that adds up to 1. So we want the z-score that corresponds to 0.96 because these two together are everything less than or equal to our z-value. So we can do this and... Just to derive another z-score for you, for 92%, we get that it is just around 1.75. That's another one to add to this table. Um, so the general formula for this is our z critical is going to be um, our confidence level plus um, one minus the confidence level over two, or that's what it corresponds to. Um, another way you can do it is one minus one minus the confidence level over two. It's the area we need. Um, but you can kind of derive it like this every single time. You The confidence level corresponds to the middle area, so you need to add the left tail, and that's your area. OK. So now we have everything we need to make a confidence interval. We have our standard error, a p hat, which is square root p hat q hat, over n, that is all underneath the square root. And then we have what's called our margin of error. We call it me. It is our z critical times p hat q hat over n, which is z critical times standard error of p hat. Now our, our confidence interval is our p hat, our this is called our estimate, plus minus our margin of error. So the full equation is p hat plus minus z critical square root p hat q hat over n. So um, let's use some numbers. Um, simplest example I can think of. Is 30 people have a condition out of a random sample of 100? Find a 92% confidence interval for the true proportion. So um, we need to satisfy our conditions. Um, 
will assume independence, just because this is a simple example, just because it's from a random sample. Uh, randomization. 10% um, condition. Obviously, a sample of 30 is less than 10% of our population. The, the one we need to check is NP is greater than or equal to 10, and Q is greater than or equal to 10. Now, our P hat is 30 over 100. That's 0.3. So our Q hat is one minus that is 0 0.7. So 100 times 0.3 is 30. It's obviously greater than 10. And then 100 times 0 0.7 is equal to 70 is greater than 10. So um, our success failure condition is also approved. Now we do the math. So we have the square root P hat Q hat over N. So our standard error of p hat is square root of 0.3 times 0.7 over 100. This is 0.046. Our Z critical from above is 1.75. So our margin of error is our Z critical times our standard error. P hat is 1.75 times 0.046. That is equal to Point eight oh five. Sorry, it is point oh eight oh five. Now we have P hat plus minus point oh eight oh five. Um so this is two one nine five comma point three eight oh five. And this is our confidence interval. We are now done. But the next thing you're going to be asked is to interpret the confidence interval. So this is kind of a cookie cutter cutter sentence format that you definitely want to write down in your notes. We are 92% confident that the true portion of people with this condition is between 21.95% and 38.05%. This is the interpretation of the confidence interval. So this would be a full problem. And this is what a confidence interval, for, a one sample confidence interval for a proportion is like. Um, on page 408 of your textbook, Sorry, 486. There's a really good page talking about good and bad interpretations of a confidence interval. The above sentence is the only way to interpret a confidence interval. There are a lot of, you'll see when you read it, a lot of people claim two broad things. And now we're going to talk about what a confidence interval truly means. So, if we have this line, this represents our true proportion, which we do not know. I'm just showing you this for, you know, teaching purposes. Let's say our first confidence interval looks like this. That's good. That means the true population parameter is contained in there. Our next one is maybe like this, it's towards the bottom. Then like this, then like this. That misses the true parameter. And you keep doing this. If you have a small one, 
and you keep doing this over and over again. In the long run, after you take a lot of samples, we're talking hundreds or thousands of samples, the percentage of confidence intervals that contain the true parameter is the confidence level. So the percentage of confidence level, of confidence intervals that contain the true parameter is, I'm going to call it confidence level percent. So if you have a 90% confidence interval, that means 900 out of 1,000 of your confidence intervals should contain the true population parameter. But this begs the question, what is probability that one random confidence interval contains the true parameter. And I'm generalizing because we're going to talk about confidence intervals for means and stuff. This is always true. The theory is true. So you might be tempted to say the confidence level percentage. If we have a 90% confidence interval, 90% or 0% or 100%? The answer is 0 or 1, because we never know. If we did know, we wouldn't even need a confidence interval. If we know the true population proportion, we don't need to do samples, because we have the answer already. But in real life, we don't, so that's why we do this. So in any given interval, you have no idea whether you've done, you know, whether your sample has captured the, the parameter or not. That's why we want to sample a bunch of times, right? If you are flipping a coin and you want to see the percentage of heads, obviously in real life we know it's 50%, but maybe your first time you get a confidence interval that doesn't include 50%. Then the next one you do, the next one you do, the next one you do. And eventually you say, hey, it's probably around 50%. That's how a lot of things were deduced in real life. There's a really cool example um, later on that basically tells how uh, how physicists discovered what the speed of light was. And they used confidence intervals and did enough of them to deduce the exact speed of light. Uh, this is how, this is now the beginning of how statistics is really used in the real world. Um, something I tell my students is uh, political polling. Usually you'll see like, Candidate A, 51%. Uh, Candidate B, 49%. And then at the very bottom, it'll say margin of error plus minus 3%. Now in politics, 3% is a big margin of error. However, that's usually considered a good margin of error. Um, these numbers are actually what the 2016 elections were. This was Clinton. This was Trump. Then in some of the, the key swing states, these numbers were 48% and 52%. Well, guess what? The polls didn't lie. That's within the margin of error. However, the way they wrote this, you know, where this was just a small little thing at the bottom, it was kind of misleading because this makes you think Clinton's going to win. But really, it was completely up for grabs. So this is an example of how it's used in real life. Um, so there's important things. So our confidence interval, again, is p hat plus minus z critical times the standard error of p hat. As the standard error increases, our margin of error increases, which widens the confidence interval, right? Because over, as we were multiplying a number, so we're, we're spreading it out further. Similarly, there is a trade-off between confidence level and 
confidence interval size. As the confidence level increases, the confidence interval gets bigger because that's our Z critical. We're multiplying by a positive number. So, you know, sure, it'd be nice to have a 99.999% confidence interval. We can do that with a, it's a Z of around 4.0, but it's gonna be a huge interval. You know, for this poll, it might be a margin of error of 10%, which is basically pointless. So there's a trade-off. Um, you know, 99% is not the best. Sometimes we want 90%. Um, I believe in the US court system, it's between, it's either 90 or 95% that is acceptable by, by court standards. Because again, there's always a trade-off. Obviously, people don't really do like 93.4% because that's just weird. But usually around 95% is like the most common. Um, but it doesn't invalidate any of the others. Obviously, too low a confidence level isn't appealing to people. So that's why it is what it is. One thing we can do is if, like, given p hat equals 0.4, z critical equals 2, what should our sample size be to have margin of error equals 0.2? So we need to say margin of error is 0.2. So 0.2 is equal to z critical square root p hat q hat over n. 0.2 is equal to 2 times square, square root 0 0.4, 0 0.6 over n. We divide over here. Square root 0.24 over n. Square both sides. 0.01 is 0.24 over n. And then we get that just by cross multiplying and dividing n equals 24. Um, even if it's with real people, it's okay to leave it as a decimal if it is a decimal. Um, otherwise round up, not down. So um Just looking at the homework examples. This is chapter 16, number 37. Um, an insurance company checks police records 582 randomly selected accidents and teens were driving in 91 of them. Before we even continue on the question, let's look what we have. Our p hat is kind of implicit. It's 91 over 582. And our n is 582. We now have all the information. Well, besides the confidence level, we have all the information we need to make a confidence interval. Part A says make a 95% confidence interval. So we know our z critical is 2. So standard of error of p hat is square root of 91 over 582. Our q hat is obviously you can plug this into a calculator. I'm just doing it in fractions just so I don't need to. Is that um, obviously if you want to do this, use a calculator. 
over 582. So our confidence interval will be 91 over 582 plus minus two times square root, or let me just call it SD of P hat. Um, eventually we see that this answer is Sorry. This answer is point one two seven two point eight six. So I'm just going to say it out loud. Your interpretation of the confidence interval, which is the next part, is that ninety. We are ninety five percent confident that the truth portion of teens in car accidents is between 12.7% and 18.6%. So, um, the next part is explain what 95% confidence means. So I just want to tell you in general what confidence level means. Um, We'll say, we'll just say, just to give a number, 95% confidence means that we expect, this, this is an expected value, we expect 95% of all confidence intervals, well, sorry, of all 95% confidence intervals of the same sample size from the same population will contain the true population parameter. This is very important. This is the interpretation of the confidence level. In this case, this is 95% confidence. So the confidence level means we expect 95% of all 95% confidence intervals from the same size, same population to contain the true population mean. Population parameter, excuse me. Um, part D says, a politician urges tighter restrictions on driver's license issued to teens because every one in five, in every one out of five accidents, a teen is behind the wheel. Does your confidence interval support or contradict the statement? We'd say it contradicts, right? Because both of these numbers are less than 20%. We expect we are 95% confident that the true population parameter is between 12.7 and 18.6%. Maybe it's only 13%. You know, the politicians just kind of jacking up the numbers. So here's another example. Um, you know, I definitely recommend going through more examples, um, but understanding the math and the, the key concepts of what a confidence level is and what a confidence uh, interval interpretation is, is really important. If you can do all that, you're in great shape. So uh, thanks for watching and I'll see you all soon.